discuss ways to improve the business <coughs> provisions of the U.S. tax code with an eye toward creating jobs and boosting uh, wages for American workers and improving our country's overall business climate. Uh, good morning. Um, tax reform's impact on the commercial real estate industry will have wide-ranging effects on the economy and job creation and the overall GDP, and I'm honored to be here today to talk with you about this issue. But it's not the first time that our industry has been before this committee and talked about tax reform. In 1981, Congress provided our industry with very aggressive tax incentives. These tax incentives spawned a robust tax shelter industry and resulted in the development of millions of buildings that had no tenants. In 1986, Congress rightly eliminated these tax shelter provisions. However, the combination of these actions caused severe dislocation in real estate markets nationwide, caused great numbers of lost jobs, resulted in countless bankruptcies, and many people believe that it ultimately led to the demise of the savings and loan industry. It took years for the economic pain to work through the system. Our industry steadily has recovered, and with congressional assistance, the federal taxation of real estate investment today is much closer to matching the economics of the investment. As a result, the commercial real estate industry today is estimated to provide about 20 percent of the nation's GDP. Our industry now employs millions of Americans, provides local governments with its largest revenue source, and plays a key role in the retirement savings and wealth creation of Americans. Importantly, commercial real estate markets today are largely imbalanced, where supply only modestly exceeds demand. Now, despite our industry's relative positive health, we know the underlying economy can and should grow more rapidly. Properly designed tax reform can spur overall job creation, encourage more robust business expansion, improve the standard of living for all Americans, and result in sustainable uh, GDP uh, increase. The first step should be reducing the tax on all job-creating businesses. This action should not be limited to corporate income, but should also include income from passenger businesses. And I want to pledge to Senator Wyden that our industry and our organization will work very hard to make sure that there are not games played on compensation uh, earned. Uh, Pro-growth tax reform should also encourage uh, and reward risk through capital gain. And capital gain should continue to recognize that it's not just cash that is put in an investment that should be rewarded. Some concepts, however, may have unintended consequences. For example, our capital markets today are the envy of the world. Entrepreneurs are able to access debt amounts needed to provide their businesses with flexibility to build, operate, and grow their businesses. We should continue that and not end the deduction for business expense. The proposal to expense uh, assets is troubling to us because it is suggested to apply to structures. We think that carries great potential uh, negative consequences. Expensing structures would obviously encourage a lot of development, but we're concerned that this development would not be supported by underlying demand, and such uneconomic development is a false indicator of economic strength and will badly distort markets. Uh, this is not to say, however, that the current cost recovery system is correct for our industry. We think it should be shortened. And MIT has re reviewed a wealth of data regarding buildings, and their findings suggest that the proper economic life of buildings is 20 years. We believe a 20-year life twinned with a continuation of the interest deduction will spur sustainable uh, development and sustainable GDP expansion. The deduction for federal, uh, state, and local property tax uh, payments uh, should continue. We think that will cause many businesses to leave our urban areas, and we reject that idea. Uh, we believe the like-kind exchange rules also should be continued. We think they're a positive part of the economy. I would like to say that in 2015, Congress took a very positive step in the PATH Act regarding the taxation of foreign investment in U.S. real property. Uh, we urge you to now take another step and repeal that uh, entirely. Uh, one final item that I would like to add and that is that we would urge you to consider uh, an infrastructure initiative of some type in tax reform. Action in this area is badly needed. It would create jobs, and if it's done correctly, and by correctly I mean to understand the transportation revolution that is going on in our country and where we will be going as far as transportation needs and mobility in the future, and if we do it, if Congress and policymakers do it the correct way, 
it not only would create jobs, but increase productivity for workers and uh, our businesses. And uh, I would be happy, we have uh, submitted a detailed statement, and I'd be happy to uh, respond to any questions about it or my comments today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll include it in your written statements concerns regarding limitations on the deductibility of interest expenses. Mr. DeBoer, your testimony laid out the potential and significant negative effects on the real estate industry of such a limitation. However, we frequently hear how the current tax treatment of debt and equity financing leads to over-leveraging of businesses and limiting the deductibility of interest expense brings the tax treatment of the two more in sync. I'd like your respective thoughts on, on that, uh, Mr. Lewis and Mr. DeBoer, if you could, if you could do it for us. Mr. Chairman, um, the issue of over-leverage, I think, is really one that should be examined on an individual-by-individual individual basis. If there's over-leverage, it's a problem with the regulators that were supposed to be determining whether someone had too much leverage, and we would prefer that the issue be dealt with there, not through the tax uh, code. Uh, the use of debt is very, very important for all businesses, not just startup businesses and not just uh, uh, small businesses, but all businesses that need this kind of flexibility to use debt. Debt, by the way, allows entrepreneurs to retain more control over their business operation. If they have equity, they give up control of some of their business. They retain more control over their business operations by using debt. It's something that historically has been uh, recognized as a cost uh, of doing business, like other costs of doing business, and we really see no reason uh, to adjust it through the tax code. That's not to say that we think that people should be over-leveraged or that businesses should be over-levered. They shouldn't be. There should be governors on that, and there's other parts of the government uh, should act. By the way, in the real estate uh, industry, from a macro point of view, I believe our industry is now levered at about 60%. Uh, publicly traded REITs, for example, are levered at even lower amounts, 40 or 45 percent uh, on average. And Mr. DeBoer, one of the things that I'm most interested in is before we launch into this discussion about the tax code, just as any business person would do, they take an assessment of the environment and what are the needs and opportunities of that company and what are the needs and opportunities of our nation. One of those things that I think has been missing in this equation as it relates to uh, our discussion are what are those needs and opportunities as it relates to housing. Could you comment on that as it relates to the tax code and what we need to be doing? Certainly. I think, uh, you know, most people, most business people that operate, certainly in urban areas, recognize that there's a tremendous grow and growing shortage of what we would call uh, workforce housing. And so people that are uh, middle American uh, citizens, firemen, teachers, what have you, combined incomes working very, very hard are being priced out of our nation's cities. And we need to focus on ways to incentivize affordable housing, not just low-income housing, which is obviously needed, but, but workforce housing as well. And, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. I don't have any solutions to share with you, or, or, but it is certainly a, a, a growing and troubling problem. Uh, and as we go forward, that part of our nation has to be included in whatever is done uh, uh, in economic growth. So do you think just cutting the corporate tax rate gets us affordable housing? Well, uh, no, I don't think it really will have anything to do with affordable housing. It would put hopefully more people to work and it would provide more money in pe people's paychecks and perhaps they would have more money to buy a, a workforce housing, but it wouldn't directly stimulate workforce. Do you think affordable housing is a crisis in America? Uh, I'm not sure I would call it a crisis. I think there's an awful lot of multifamily housing being constructed today, uh, meeting a demand for it, but it's not meeting that segment of the economy. And, and people need to understand, land is land, and it's going to cost the same thing regardless of its use almost. And construction costs are quite high. And so when people construct uh, assets, multifamily, uh, retail, office buildings, what have you, they're paying ro roughly the same cost to construct them. And so it's hard to understand why they would then provide low-income housing or workforce housing because it doesn't 
pencil out for them from an economic point of view. So there does have to be assistance uh, there, we think, whether that's zoning assistance or local tax break assistance or something from the federal. Or expansion of the low-income housing tax credit. Well, or making a keep in mind as uh, tax reform goes forward and rates lower, and I certainly am not suggesting that we don't want lower rates, but the market for the low-income tax credit is made more robust and more, you know, positive because of what rates are. As rates go down, those will become less valuable. And again, I'm not suggesting that rates don't come down. I'm simply suggesting that if you keep the low-income housing program as it is, the incentive will naturally be reduced, and perhaps a rethinking of that incentive is in order. Well, I, I think you said something very important there, but I'm not sure everybody understood it. Basically, what I may said. not have understood it, but it was fun <laughs> saying it. I think you said it technically correct, but the translation is that basically because a lot of people who have invested in affordable housing, as we have given them incentives for investing in it through the LIHTC program, as they're sitting there waiting to see what's going to happen with a corporate tax rate or tax rates overall, they're sitting on capital and we're actually suppressing the amount of available investment in affordable housing at the same time that we have a crisis. So to me, as we ponder this big question, um, particularly as it relates to this issue of dynamic scoring and whether you're going to get dynamic growth from it, I want to make sure everybody clearly understands that housing somehow has lost its way. It used to be in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you would say when you wanted to stimulate our economy, the cheer would go up for housing. But you haven't heard that cheer in a long time. And it's time for us to focus on the fact that affordable housing is a crisis. And it's certainly a crisis in my state. It's certainly a crisis in Seattle. And we need to make sure that we're putting the right incentives in place. This is just as important as the rest of the discussion we're having here. So thank you, Mr. DeVere. If I may just add one thing. If you look at, and it was referenced, how long we are into the economic recovery, and you looked at where, forget about affordable or low-income housing, but simply home building in general is, it is off where it typically would be at this point in the recovery anyway. And if it was only where it should normally historically be, our GDP would be a point higher, some suggest. And I just throw that out. And again, Thank you. those solutions. Thank you. I just, uh, now I call that growth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished Chairman is back. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Senator Cardin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all the witnesses. Uh, Mr. DeBoer, I'm sorry I wasn't here when you were talking about uh, incentives for uh, energy efficiency. We're strongly uh, going to work to make sure we can preserve uh, those issues. I, I want to ask a question about the pass-throughs uh, as to what is a fair way to handle this. Uh, pass-through companies do not have to pay double taxation. That is true. However, when you look at global competition, they are still paying a much higher rate than their global competitors because of the marginal tax rates in the United States. And the overwhelming majority of American businesses do not pay the C rate. I think the C rate now amounts to about 5 or percent of the, re of the companies somewhere in that le level. So as we look for reform in order to make our business tax structure more competitive, if that's one of our goals for growth, what do we do about making sure we don't have the unintended consequences of hurting those companies that have the current status on pass-throughs? How do we protect them if the rates don't change, if we just do C-rate? Uh, how do you deal with that issue? Senator Cardin, I, I, I would, I'll take the first swing at that. and, and uh we do appreciate your work on energy efficiency for buildings. It's a very, very important, uh, very important topic going forward, and hopefully it can be included. Um, Pass-throughs, certainly for our industry, very, very few uh, real estate uh, businesses are operated in corporate format. Um, almost all are uh, LLCs, uh, publicly traded or privately traded uh, REITs, uh, or partnerships. In fact, real estate consists of almost half of all partnerships in America. So we're highly concerned and focused on how we can uh, achieve a lower tax rate for those, uh, those entities. Right now, there's a 5% spread between corporate and the ordinary rate. 
we see no reason that if the corporate rate is coming down that a comparable spread shouldn't be the result of tax reform this time, or you are going to put pass-through entities which uh, really drive the economy in many ways in the United States at a disadvantage, not only globally, but vis-a-vis -vis, no. uh, their competitive uh, their competitors in the corporate world here. So we want to work very, very much. I, I agree. And with I that. mentioned to Senator Wyden, yeah. Senator, that I'm very. We are. We share the concern about potential shifting of what is service-related income in a pass-through into yeah. that lower bucket. And we've worked very, very hard internally to try and come up with a way to deal with that. Well, I, I thank you for that response. I think we all have to keep our eyes on this issue because it could get lost in some of the proposals that are being made. And I. I agree with the point that you made, particularly in the real estate sector. The pass-throughs are critically important, I know, in my state. Uh, in your testimony, you make the case against the immediate expensing of real estate, given the unique nature of these assets. Your testimony also notes the recent MIT study that suggests the recovery periods for commercial real estate under the current tax code are out of sync with the economic recovery period of such property. Since we're trying to build a tax code that will promote sustained economic growth, would shortening the recovery period for commercial buildings from 39 years and rental housing from 27 and a half years be a reasonable alternative to immediate expensing? Yes, we, we strongly believe that. And I don't disagree at all with uh, what's been said about the power of expensing. I'm simply saying that sustainability in our industry. It will incent our industry to build, but we see no benefit to building buildings that are ahead of the demand in the economy. It puts stress on local markets. It puts stress on lenders' balance sheets, and ultimately it's not good for the long-term growth of the economy. And so we are more, from our industry, more interested in economic, uh, economic lives of assets and real estate, as MIT has studied, uh, real estate's proper economic life is closer to 20 years than 39 or 27 and a half years. And by the way, there is some misunderstanding about real estate. Why would you depreciate a building that people see standing for many, many years? And these buildings are very, very capital intensive. It's not just that they fall down. People invest money into these buildings to keep them a competitive part of our uh, economy. And and allow these buildings to adapt and be flexible to accommodate business as it changes over time. And I don't think anyone here would want to move into an apartment or a live in an, a work in an office that hasn't been rehabbed and updated for 30 or 40 years. So that's what this depreci depreciation is about. It's both physical wear and tear and economic obsolescence. So yes, I agree with what you're saying. And, and you suggest, I think, a 20-year recovery period. Would you apply that to both residential and non-residential property? Uh, I would, but there might be an argument based on what Senator Cantwell suggested earlier that you may want to have a different life for uh, residential versus non-residential, which is in current law today, and that's there largely as an incentive for housing. And lastly, should we consider expanding the 15-year 15 15-year recovery period that applies to improvements to certain types of real property and, and or shorten that period as well? Well, I, if, if tax reform adopts an expensing policy for all assets other than longer-lived, and that's where I would define it, a longer-lived asset like a structure, then I would say that leasehold improvements to accommodate the business needs should be expensed like any other business uh, uh, investment, yeah. if that's the direction that Congress goes. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to have Mr. Lewis and then uh, Mr. DeBoer comment on their proposals, whether the concerns raised are legitimate, but perhaps overblown, and provide us with your thoughts on administrative issues associated with your proposals. A couple of maybe bigger picture points first, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Senator uh, Stabenow talked about how we can help Americans and American businesses, I think the first thing to keep in mind is not to do any harm to them. And some of the proposals, particularly on the revenue offset side, dramatically impact domestically based capital intensive industries that are conducted in pass-through format. And that's why we're so interested in this pass-through rate. I, I understand, Senator McCaskill, on the income to the top 1%. I'd like to look at that data. I think that may include compensation for services to the entity, which we are very, very interested, as Mr. Lewis is, in making sure that that income does not come down and be taxed at the new 
uh, at a new lower rate. We have done a significant amount of work here to try and look at the relationship between partners in a, in a pass-through entity and, and how much service is provided to the entity itself. And our, our proposal at first blush is a little bit complicated. We're starting to reach out to staff and flesh it out. And, and I guess for purposes of this hearing, I simply want to repeat what I said earlier in my opening statement. We are pledged to work with the committee, Senator Wyden, Senator McCaskill, and others, to make sure that true compensation to the entity does not, uh, there's no gamesmanship and comes down. But the fact of the matter is, these pass-through entities do earn income, and that income should, I mean, the income, whether it's from rents in the real estate business or development fees or what have you, and that income should be taxed lower if, in fact, corporate taxes are going to come down. And one other item that I would say, these pass-through entities are the vehicle of choice for startup businesses. They're the vehicle of choice for minority-owned businesses. And this is how most Americans who are interested in using their business acumen to develop jobs and expand our economy, this is the format that they do. So encouraging activity in this area is very much commendable, and thank you for, for looking at this. It's a complicated issue, but one that I have no doubt you and your staff can tackle. Well, thanks to all four of you. I think this has been a really interesting hearing. And I want to thank you all for your attendance and for your contributions here today. As I noted last week, this committee's approach to tax reform will be methodical and inclusive. Uh, that is why hearings like uh, the one we have just had today will be critically important as we continue to evaluate the tax code and continue with marking up a bill that will enact meaningful, durable, and efficient reforms. My strong preference is that our evaluations, determinations, and the final language of any bill we come up with will be bipartisan, and I intend to work towards that end. That means we have a lot of work to do, but I'm optimistic that we can get it done.